Okay, good morning. Welcome to the long-awaited webinar and our conversation with the president of the Boston Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, we had hoped to have had this earlier in the year, but glad that we can do it now. As a programming note for uh, all of the participants, we will have a question and answer period uh, at the end. Uh, obviously, we're not gonna ask those uh, individually um, because of the webinar feature, but you can use the chat box or the chat feature um, on your program and submit a question, uh, and we'll try to get to those as we can. This is the first of what was supposed to be two large events this week. Uh, uh, tomorrow, the Norwell VNA had been scheduled to have a large live event with 100 people, all socially distanced and properly spaced. Uh, but because of the governor's revised order of no gathering over 50, that had to be canceled at the last minute, which is unfortunate because we were looking forward to a, a live event. And it was special because it was part of the Norwell VNA's 100th anniversary celebration this year, one of uh, many events that they're hoping to have. Uh, we're thrilled that the VNA has reached 100 years. They've been a great asset to the South Shore. And we're so happy to have the chairman of the Norwell VNA, uh, or the president, serve as the chairman of our board. So, with that, I'd like to turn over the program to our chairman, Renee McGinnis, uh, for introductions. Thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, we are very uh, blessed to have actually Barbara Bush be accepting uh, an award on behalf of her grandmother for her being a champion for palliative and hospice care. And um, when she, I, I, I don't know if you all remember in her, her tenure, um, how she went to the grandma's house and held babies with AIDS to show people that that was okay. So um, we will still give her the award tomorrow, socially distancing at our hospice home, but um, we're 100. And as you know, 100 years ago, there was a pandemic. So we were caring for people 100 years ago and we're caring for people in their home today. So, um, but thank you so much, Peter, for that. Just as a programming note before we start and introduce our speaker, um, we will be having Q&A uh, after um, Eric Rosenberg's speech and our Grand Inquisitor for the morning will be Carol Bowman. Uh, for those of you who, do, who don't know Carol, uh, she's well known to most of our members as president of Jack Conway Company. Um, what most people don't know is that she also sits on the Federal Reserve Bank's New England Advisory Council. So welcome so much, Carol, and thank you so much for giving us your time today. Um, the VNA is not <clears throat> the only group that has made sudden changes this year with events. Uh, back in March, we had planned on our annual economic forecast breakfast with a special guest, Eric Rosengreen, and we were all very excited for that. And as I said to him yesterday, we're even more excited to hear what he has to say post-pandemic. Um, this was pre-pandemic, right? Um, so our scheduling was off by two weeks, unfortunately. We just missed, missed the chance to get the breakfast in before the shutdown. A lot has happened since then. We are pleased that Eric is able to join us and help us understand not only what has happened since March, but perhaps what we can look ahead to for recovery, which I know we're all anxious to hear about. Some positive notes, hopefully. Um, Eric was appointed president of the Boston Federal Reserve Bank in 2007. He sits on the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve, which is monetary policy making body of the federal government. The Boston Federal Reserve is also in charge of the Main Street Lending Program, created to help small businesses through the shutdown and recovery. Well, well needed. In addition to helping shape national policy, Eric leads the Reserve Bank's research and understanding of economic trends in New England. In that role, the Boston Federal Reserve has focused Main Street economic stability, as well as low and moderate income communities. In his spare time, which I don't know where he finds that, he also serves as chairman of the board of Colby College. My sister and my niece went to Colby, so great school. Um, so Eric, thank you so much for joining us tomorrow, this morning and giving us some of your time that I know you have little of. So, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. Thank 
you very much, Renee, and thank you, Peter, for inviting me to talk. And as they both highlighted, uh, we had hoped to have this in person uh, in spring. And unfortunately, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we put it off. And at first, we were hoping to put it off uh, just long enough to be able to do it in person again. But the pandemic seems to be lasting longer than any of us expected uh, when we first decided to postpone. So apologies that we can't do it in person but I'm glad the technology is available that we can at least have this discussion today and hopefully have uh, lots of good questions as I go through my presentation. Next slide, please. So the economy and the pandemic are very much intertwined right now. Uh, there was a very unusual statement that was in the FOMC statement at the end of the July meeting where at the lead of a paragraph, it said the path of the economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus. So I think that's an important theme that I'm gonna be touching on uh, throughout this talk, which is that as long as we are not able to control the virus, it's gonna be very difficult for the economy to get back to full employment with an inflation rate around 2%. So this is a significant headwind. And while we can take a lot of actions to help mitigate what's happening from the virus. In the end, this is a public health crisis and a public health crisis has to be dealt with with public health solutions. So many people are reducing their social interactions. I would highlight that while some of the reduction in economic activity initially was because of shutdowns that are mandated, much of the reduction in activity that we're seeing now is not just from the public health mandates, it's also from individuals changing their behavior as they want to be careful that they don't get sick uh, as a result of going shopping, uh, meeting with other people, doing things that we were very comfortable doing last February. But uh, I, I mean, I never thought going to the grocery store would be a frightening experience. But I think we've all encountered that there are a lot more difficulties in doing fairly mundane activities uh, that we didn't have prior to the pandemic. So we have had a shutdown in the spring. There is talk about whether some states will have to have additional shutdowns. And if the fall indicates that there is a, a worse problem with the pandemic, there may need to be uh, some shutdowns. But there is a much less costly alternative. And that's for us to use common sense measures to try to restrict the pandemic. So wearing masks, maintaining social distance, avoiding crowds, particularly indoors, those are all common sense. And if everybody were to follow that pretty stringently, the need for a shutdown uh, would diminish very significantly. However, if our behaviors don't change, uh, obviously some parts of the country may be in a situation where uh, they're in a situation where their hospitals are under a great deal of stress and may have to shut down. Now, New England right now is doing much better than many other parts of the country. We have a low infection rate relative to both the South and the West. In many respects, New England looks a little bit more like some of the European countries in terms of we took the uh, shutdown pretty seriously. And as a result, we did push down the infection rate. And as I'm going to argue today, those actions have set us up to actually be better off than many other parts of the country. Uh, because while they were able to benefit initially um, over time, if the pandemic gets worse in those areas, they're gonna be faced with a situation where both public health and the economy don't do as well as they would have if they had followed uh, public health guidelines. Next slide, please. So normally, uh, if you had very substantial monetary and fiscal policy actions, you'd expect a really robust recovery. And I think one of the unusual aspects of this is that monetary and fiscal policy have been unusually well-coordinated. Uh, both monetary and fiscal policy have taken very substantial actions, and they've been very timely. That frequently isn't the case in a recession. So in terms of fiscal policy, uh, as people are well aware, there have been higher unemployment benefits. Those benefits have been extended to more workers than they normally are. There have been payments to low-income individuals uh, that are direct payments. All those things are helping substantially. Uh, enable people to bridge themselves to hopefully a time where the pandemic is less disruptive. Monetary policy also has been both very large and very timely. We very quickly in March dropped interest rates close to zero. 
Uh, we've done a lot of asset purchases to help stabilize financial markets. And we've been very active in liquidity facilities. And I'm gonna discuss one of those facilities uh, operated by the Boston Fed, the Main Street Lending Program, which is designed to help facilitate credit flows for small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, and I think is actually going to be critically important as we get into the fall. Next slide, please. Uh, if we start looking at some of the higher frequency data, so normally when I give a talk, I'm pretty much focused on government data. Uh, most of that data comes out at a monthly or a quarterly basis and with a fairly significant lag. Uh, because the pandemic is kind of ebbing and flowing in significant ways and different ways across the country, higher frequency data are actually quite useful. So we've been looking at higher frequency data that tracks spending. Uh, so you can see spending data on a daily basis. You can track mobility, how much people are moving around on a daily basis. That data indicates that we're likely to be in a bit of a pause. And that pause is particularly uh, relevant in parts of the country with higher infection rates like the South and the West. Uh, some of their hospitals are reaching ICU capacity, and as a result, uh, either through mandated changes or through people behaving differently, uh, we're seeing that spending and mobility in those parts of the country in particular uh, have been reduced. So monetary and fiscal policy is really critical, but really what is critical is to get the virus under control so that people can get back to normal patterns of behavior. Next slide, please. So this first chart would be a chart that, uh, other than in a pandemic, I would never show. And the reason, because it's a really boring chart. Um, what it's showing you is real disposable personal income. So real disposable personal income, so personal income that takes into account uh, inflation has been growing pretty steadily since 2000. You can see there are some small blips here and there, but by and large, it follows a pretty straight line. But if you turn to the very far right side, you can see that the blip that we've most recently seen is something that we haven't seen since the turn of the uh, millennium. And that is that uh, we've seen a very substantial increase in real disposable personal income. What that reflects is the fiscal policy. So that's exactly what happens when you have a lot of unemployment benefits going to individuals, when people get a lot of checks in the mail, they have a lot more disposable income. And so what you see is this is really a historic response to the pandemic that we haven't seen in the last two recessions. So fiscal policy has been actively engaged. Next slide, please. Now, ideally what you want in order to stimulate the economy is for individuals to actually spend that money. And what this shows is the savings rate. And so, uh, What's a little bit unusual is that you normally, for an individual, uh, want to have a significant amount of savings, but as an economy, you actually want people to do a fair amount of spending because if they're consuming goods and services, that means that you're employing more workers and that's a positive for growth in real GDP. But if you look at the far right during the pandemic period, uh, not only did personal income blip up, but so did the personal savings rate. That reflects a number of features. Uh, one of those features is that there's less to spend on. So if what you like to spend money on is restaurants, taking trips, uh, vacations, going to hotels, uh, the pandemic has substantially limited your ability to spend. So some of the increase in savings rate is an indication that many individuals don't have the things they wanna spend on right now, and so they're holding the money. A second, um, uh, feature though is that many people are unemployed. We have more than a 10% unemployment rate right now. Many people are worried about what the future is going to be. And so if you're worried that your unemployment benefits may be reduced, you're not sure what Congress is going to agree to, if anything, uh, you might choose to keep your check or keep your unemployment benefits and try to save as much as you can in case those benefits are shut off as we get into the fall. So I think both those elements are some of the reasons for why the savings rate is so high, which means we're not getting quite as much consumption as we would hope. Next slide, please. Now, monetary policy has also been unusually aggressive. As you can see on the far right, 
the dark blue line, which is the federal funds rate. Uh, when the economy was doing well, uh, the federal funds rate had been gradually rising. Uh, roughly uh, a year ago, we started uh, already reducing rates a little bit. But when we hit March, we dropped rates very quickly and very significantly, and basically the Fed funds rates very close to zero right now. Now, a lot of people don't borrow at the very short end of the market. A lot of people borrow uh, longer term, either for car loans, for home loans, et cetera. So it's a very important to understand what's happening at the longer end of the interest rate curve. And this shows you the 10-year treasury yield and what you can see is the 10-year treasury yield has also declined very significantly. So that means the cost of funding longer term has gone down. Um, and I would note that uh, the rate that the 10-year treasury rate is now is much lower than it was at any time uh, during or shortly after the financial crisis. So some of this is monetary policy actions. Some of this is also reflecting uh, concerns that uh, many people have for what kinds of investments are going to be available going forward. But it also indicates that monetary policy has acted uh, very aggressively, and at least for short and 10-year Treasury rates, it's resulted in a very substantial reduction that's uncharacteristic of most recessions. Next slide, please. So credit interruptions are a real problem for the economy. They harm businesses, they harm individuals. And normally, if, I, if you had told me in March that we were going to have deployed fiscal and monetary policy as aggressively as we have, I would have expected a fairly robust recovery. So uh, the reason we're not having as robust a recovery as we want is not because of monetary or fiscal policy actions. So I would highlight here, it's incredible, incredibly important that we continue continue to have fiscal and monetary stimulus. So it would be very bad news if there's not some agreement in Washington on additional stimulus given where the unemployment rate is. Um, but uh, one of the challenges is that monetary and fiscal policy can't offset changes in behavior that occur from the pandemic. So even with very low interest rates, even with more uh, money in your pocket, you're not going to be able to take maybe that trip that you wanted to take to Florida to see uh, a tourist site. You're not going to feel comfortable staying in a hotel and you're not going to be comfortable eating your, all your meals in restaurants. So uh, until you get the pandemic under better control, it becomes very difficult for monetary policy or fiscal policy by itself to offset this challenge. So the trajectory of the economic recovery is going to be determined more by the path of the virus than the path of policy making. Next slide, please. And so it's really important uh, as we're trying to do economic projections, we're spending a lot more time looking at data that's related to virus and deaths than we normally would. So we normally aren't looking at epidemiological data. Uh, but um, at the Boston Fed, throughout the Federal Reserve System, economists are spending a lot more time with that data. So this chart compares what's happening uh, with the infection rates in the United States and Europe. So it's new cases per million population, so that it's a somewhat standard chart. As everybody in New England remembers, uh, we had a severe problem as we got into March and April. That pretty much was mimicked in Europe, and you can see that the infection rate uh, in the Northeast in particular, but throughout the United States and in Europe rose quite quickly through the month of March. You can see that there were shutdowns that occurred after that. And uh, in Europe, they were quite successful in bringing the infection rate to quite low levels. Uh, in the United States, unfortunately, we have not been nearly as successful, both because we probably opened up too quickly, we didn't open up as appropriately, and behaviors didn't change as much. So as you can see, as we got into June after uh, Memorial Weekend, um, a lot of places in the country were experiencing higher infection rates. And you can see in sharp contrast to Europe, which has seen a little bit of an increase uh, more recently, uh, we remain at very elevated levels right now in terms of infection rates in many parts of the country. Next slide, please. This looks at deaths, um, and again, it's standardized to look at deaths per million. Again, it's comparing what's happened in Europe to the United States. Uh, 
Europe has a slightly older population. Uh, they had less control of the virus in, initially, and you can see that deaths per million population uh, increased quite substantially in Europe uh, and increased in the United States with somewhat of a lag since the virus problem came to the United States with a bit of delay. You can see that Europe is successful in bringing the death rate down substantially. Unfortunately, the United States has not. Uh, while it did come down through April and May as we were having uh, restrictions on social mobility, you can see that basically since the middle of June, after the states relaxed, uh, not only did the infection rate go up, but deaths have gone up as well. Uh, they haven't gone up as significantly as infection rates, in part because the distribution of people being affected is a little bit skewed more towards uh, the younger side than the older side now. Uh, it's also that treatments in hospitals and by medical professionals have improved. But nonetheless, it is disturbing to see this kind of loss of human life that's occurring because we have not got the infection rate under control. Next slide, please. This looks at the cumulative deaths per million population. So looking at the European uh, situation, basically uh, by the time that they had stopped their mandated shutdowns, they had the virus enough in control that it pretty much flatlined uh, the deaths going through June and July. There's a slight upward tilt there, but it's quite slight. Uh, in the United States, where we have not been nearly as successful, um, we can see that we flattened the line for a bit in April and May, but unfortunately, we're still seeing fairly significant rises in cumulative deaths per million dollar population and the difference between the experience in the United States and Europe is becoming more dramatic as we continue to have uh, the situation not under control. Next chart, please. One of the main reasons for this difference is the different reactions that Europeans had relative to the virus compared to the United States. So you can see that Germany's in blue, France is in orange, Italy is in bluish green, and the United States is in dark blue. And you can see as the virus started to become a problem in March, uh, the Europeans really did a very severe shutdown. So they really enforced people having to stay at home, except for kind of exigent circumstances, enough to get food or emergency medical. Um, as a result, uh, the shutdown was much more effective. This is a chart that shows you visits to retail and recreation locations. And you can see that if you were in France, Italy, or uh, Germany, your trips to those type of places was substantially curtailed. You can also see that those visits continued to be uh, quite low until May and only started to rise as they started to open up uh, as a result of getting the infection rate under control. In the United States, in contrast, with a dark blue line, uh, we did not have a stringent uh, shutdown as uh, other parts of Europe or Asia. As a result, we did reduce visits to retail and recreational locations, but not to the same degree. And we opened up fairly quickly, so you can see that relatively quickly people started going back to retail and recreation locations. In contrast now, um, that has flattened out in the United States as people are once again concerned about public health issues because the pandemic is not under control. While in many European countries, because the pandemic is under control, people are once again becoming more comfortable and you're now seeing the economic benefits of getting the infection rate under control because those countries are now having more visits to retail and recreation locations. So this highlights a significant trade-off that countries that took a more severe reaction initially are probably going to have better economic outcomes as we get into the fall if they're able to maintain the pandemic to be more controlled. Parts of the world that have not controlled the pandemic as well, like the United States, may have gotten an initial thrust in the economy from opening up more quickly, but are probably going to be paying a price as we get into the fall and not see the same kind of economic growth that regions of the world that have been more successful. Next slide, please. Now the same data actually shows up if you look across states. So it's not just looking across nations. So this chart's a little complicated, 
Uh, instead of showing you data points, we're showing you states, and you can see the initials for the states. Uh, on the horizontal axis is a contact index. That's giving you an indication of how mobile the population is. On the vertical axis, it's the per cha percent change in socially distance sensitive spending. That's spending on things like uh, hotels, uh, personal care services, and uh, restaurant meals. So those kind of services are likely to be disrupted if you're worried about being socially distanced. So you can see that uh, I would highlight that, that this is looking at the percent change in spending uh, in May versus April. So those parts of the country that had the most spending in uh, May were those parts of the country that were doing the least social distancing. So you see in the far right that most of those states are in the West and are in the South. You can see that the New England states, uh, as well as um, many of the mid-Atlantic states, all of whom were much more affected by the pandemic initially, uh, all are on the lower left corner, which is saying there was much less spending in May and there was much less social mobility. Next chart, please. So this chart shows you the same kind of mobility uh, comparing June to February. Uh, so it's the time from when the pan before the pandemic through June. And on the vertical axis now, it's showing you the percent change in the infection rate for the month of July. And so what you're seeing is that in the far right, where again you see southern and western states, they saw a lot more infections as in the month of July, and they also allowed a lot more social mobility. If you look at the left corner, uh, you once again see the New England states, you see the mid-Atlantic states. So they're seeing much less infections as a result of taking uh, more significant actions and allowing much less mobility. Next chart, please. So this chart uh, on the horizontal axis, axis um, shows you the percent change in COVID cases in the month of July and looks at the change in the contact index. So what this is saying is in July, um, how many more infections were you seeing and relating that to how much you were allowing uh, contact. Here, what you're finding is that there are a lot more COVID cases in parts of the country that um, <clears throat> uh, allowed more contact. And in parts of the country that did not allow uh, much change, uh, continue to restrict mobility, uh, you're seeing much fewer COVID cases. Uh, turning to figure 11, next chart, please. This shows you what the implication is for spending, and this is the positive sign for New England. So on the horizontal axis, again, it's showing you the percent change in COVID cases in the month of July. And on the vertical axis, it's showing you the percent change in social distanced sensitive spending in July versus June. So in New England, uh, we have much fewer COVID cases, and we're now seeing that socially distanced spending is much easier to do in New England. So the fact that we have the virus more under control means that parts of New England and the mid-Atlantic states are now getting better economic outcomes than those parts of the country that decided to open up quickly with more abandon. Those parts of the country in the South and the West uh, at, for the month of July uh, had much less uh, social, distancing, uh, social distancing sensitive spending than New England did. So there's a trade-off. Uh, those parts of the country that opened quickly got a short-term economic benefit, but quite likely they're going to have a long-term economic cost as people change their behavior and possibly they have to shut down. In New England, because we shut down more effectively, we're actually going to get more economic benefits as we get through the summer and into the fall. But that requires us to continue to monitor the data in a careful way and make sure that the infection uh, rate does not skyrocket. Next chart, please. So vigilance is really important. <clears throat> uh, as I said, states that reopened early got a short-term uh, burst of activity, but it's at a cost that their economic activity is now being restrained. 
Uh, I think it's important to note that there have been recent upticks, both in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, uh, also in many places in Europe, they're starting to see upticks. As people are getting tired of the social distance uh, behavior that's required, and you're seeing more people taking higher risk activities, and as a result, you're seeing some increase in the data. Um, it's really important that states closely monitor what's happening with the infection rate <clears throat> and closely monitoring what's happening with hospital activity. And that's particularly true as we get into the fall. Um, students are going to be going back to school, or at least in some places, students are going to be going back to school. Uh, that's particularly true for colleges and high schools. Um, and weather is going to force indoor activity. That's particularly true in places like New England. So right now, it's easier to do outdoor activities. You can have friends and family over and social distance uh, out in your yard. Uh, you can eat potentially outside at a restaurant. Uh, but those activities are going to become increasingly difficult as we get into the fall and into the winter. So the failure to take into account um, the challenges of the virus could result in more severe economic outcomes as well as unnecessary loss of life. So the predictions for the economy, because it's so intertwined with the economics and the virus, it really becomes a question of how successful we are in behaving in a way that keeps the virus under control until we have better health solutions to the virus. Next chart, please. Uh, so I'm now gonna make a switch, and that switch is to talk about the Main Street Lending Program. I think it's really appropriate to talk to this audience because many of you are small and medium-sized businesses. And this really is a program designed for businesses that were in very good shape in February, had to shut down in the spring, and are continuing to see a problem with their cash flow as a result of the pandemic, but fully expect that the business is going to be uh, cash flow positive uh, once the pandemic is fully under control. So we've structured a program that's designed to actually address exactly that kind of challenge. So the way that this program has been structured is that it's providing a loan that has no payment of interest in the first year, and no payment of principal until the third year. So if you have a cash flow disruption, it means that you're not making any payments during the time where your cash flow is most severely disrupted. In order to encourage banks to do these loans, um, the banks are retaining 5% of the loans, but the Federal Reserve is retaining 95% of the risk. So the bulk of the risk is being retained by the Fed, not by the bank. There is skin in the game because we want the bank to do the underwriting to provide assurance that this is a business that has a reasonable chance once the pandemic is over to being a highly viable business. The terms of the loan, it's a five-year loan. Uh, once you do start paying interest, it's LIBOR plus 300 basis points. Uh, for riskier lenders, that is a particularly attractive rate. If you're a borrower that has been completely not impacted by the pandemic or actually benefited uh, during the pandemic, for example, if you're supplying um, personal protection equipment, um, you might be able to get much better terms directly from the bank. This is really designed for a borrower that has had a significant uh, disruption. And as a result, uh, given the uncertainty for the economy going forward, the bank may not be anxious to make the loan otherwise. The minimum loan size is 250,000. I would say the bulk of the loans that we've actually seen have been in the one to $5 million range, uh, but we have seen some uh, much smaller loans as well. We're currently uh, taking business loans, uh, but we do expect to be taking nonprofit loans. Uh, if you are a nonprofit organization on this call and you've been disrupted and think that a loan might be appropriate, um, I think, <clears throat> this would be the time to start talking to your bank. We're hoping in the next few weeks uh, to have the program up and running for the nonprofit so that we can start funding loans. But as any borrower knows, it takes a while to negotiate with your bank. Uh, those can frequently take weeks or months. So the time to negotiate that is now not wait until uh, the nonprofit part of the program is up and running. So the goal is to help uh, entities that uh, otherwise might not get funding uh, to get financing so they don't have to shut their doors and possibly result in permanently laying off employees. So financing is a critical component at times like these, and that's exactly why the Federal Reserve 
Bank has stepped in with a very unusual program. We don't normally get involved with bank lending. We're normally focused on um, markets and um, purchasing of securities. So this is quite an unusual program that's really been tailored to the pandemic. Next chart, please. This shows you the registered lenders and the asset size distribution. Um, as you can see, uh, banks in the size between one and 10 billion have uh, provided a significant amount of the registrations for the program. Uh, we have roughly 522 banks and credit unions that have signed up. Um, <clears throat> most of the large banks have signed up. Uh, we're seeing uh, a fairly substantial number of smaller community banks. And I would say the community banks have been particularly active in the lending. I'm about to show you the loan numbers. And most of those loan numbers come from the community bank and the banks one to 10 billion. Uh, to date, we have not seen that much activity from banks 50 billion and above. Uh, next chart, please. So one of the challenges is with uh, only over, a little over 500 banks registered, there are a lot more than 500 banks in the United States. Uh, that means that some banks are not participating. This is completely a voluntary program on the part of banks to participate. So one of the concerns that we heard from borrowers is that their bank was not participating and they couldn't find a bank that was willing to take non-bank customers. So as part of the registration process, we asked banks whether they would consider uh, taking loan applications from non-bank customers and be public about their willingness to take non-bank customers. Um, as you can see from this chart, uh, a number of banks have agreed to do that. This is an interactive chart on the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston uh, website. So uh, if you're in Rhode Island rather than in Massachusetts, you could pull down the state for Rhode Island. Uh, this pulls down the organizations that have publicly announced they are taking non-bank customers. You can see that it includes small banks and it also includes some large banks. Um, so this is the list of banks that have publicly disclosed. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the loan program, I would go to the Boston Fed website, which gives you uh, details about what the conditions of getting a loan are and also contact your bank. Even though your bank may not be on this list, uh, your bank may be uh, providing the loans but not being willing to publicly announce that they were gonna take non-bank customers. So I would start by talking to your existing bank relationship if you are interested in the loan after you've looked at the details of the program. Um, but if it turns out that the banks that you're currently working with are not participating in the program, you can look to this map to try to find a bank that would be interested in uh, somebody who's not currently a customer. Next chart, please. This gives you an idea of the activity. <clears throat> so in terms of the loans that we've made to date, this program just started July 6th. So uh, we've started for only about a month. Uh, the initial couple of weeks, uh, banks and borrowers are still trying to figure out the program. We've seen a steady ramp up of uh, loans coming in the direction of the Boston Fed. Uh, and we've seen a substantial increase in uh, loans that have been coming over the last week or two. You can see that out of this point, loans committed or settled are roughly a little over $250 million. You can see that the loans that are currently been submitted and under review or have uh, settled it's roughly $856 million, um, and we continue to get additional loans last night, so we're continuing to see more loans come in. So um, I fully expect that we're gonna continue to see uh, increases as more borrowers and more banks become familiar with the program. I would say banks frequently have um, some challenges initially uh, getting the loan through the program, but once they've done one or two loans, the process goes much more smoothly. Um, I would also highlight that um, how many loans we do is probably also going to be tied to what happens with the pandemic. As more businesses are disrupted in their financing by how long the pandemic's lasting, uh, the businesses that are going to require this short-term cash flow kind of lending, I think are going to increase. If we unfortunately saw a substantial increase in the fall uh, in the epidemic, 
you could imagine that a lot more businesses are going to be needing loans like this. So I think it's important that the loans are available for people that have already been disrupted, businesses that have already been disrupted, but it's gonna be even more important as we get into the fall, uh, should the pandemic become more serious and we see more serious disruption of businesses. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, there have been some initial reports that focused on the data that really were the first couple of weeks. And those data have highlighted that they thought that the program was not a success. I think many of those pundits uh, failed to take into account how long it takes to actually do a loan. So uh, very few borrowers are going to be able to negotiate a complicated loan in a matter of a week or two. Uh, loans take some time to negotiate. One of the advantages of a loan is it's a negotiation between a business and a bank where it can be customized. That both makes it very convenient for the business and the bank to structure a loan that meets the needs of the business. It also makes it much more difficult to do a program like this because it's not standardized. It's not like buying uh, corporate equity uh, where it's a very uh, standardized contract. The closing of those loans happens very, or closing of those purchases happens very quickly. Uh, for loans, it can just take much more time. So it's not at all surprising that the negotiation of these loans take a little bit of time. And not only would a loan normally take some time to negotiate, but I think an added challenge right now is that uh, the Federal Reserve, because we're taking a position in this loan, there's more paperwork, in part because there were CARES Act restrictions put on by Congress, and in part just because with our participation in a 13-3 facility, there is paperwork involved. Uh, so there is more paperwork than the standard business loan, uh, but it actually uh, provides terms that may not be available to the borrower otherwise. So I think as uh, borrowers and lenders negotiate the terms of the, the contract and bring loans to the Boston Fed, uh, we will see uh, the gradual pace of activity likely expand, and that would be particularly true as people become more comfortable with the mechanics of the program and if uh, both banks and businesses become more worried about what their cash flow is going to look like in the fall. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, credit disruptions uh, can be very harmful, and that's exactly why we've created this facility. This facility really is designed to take care of those credit disruptions. Uh, the Fed stands ready to, in the public interest, uh, to try to make sure that uh, as many uh, businesses and nonprofits as fit the program are able to access the program. The program is one of many ways that we're using to support the U.S. economy. I would encourage both uh, lenders, businesses, and nonprofits to participate in this program, look and see if it's an appropriate uh, kind of loan for the kind of problems that a business or a nonprofit's uh, facing. And if you're expecting that you're gonna have shortfalls in cash flow in the fall, I wouldn't wait till the fall. I begin the negotiations earlier rather than later. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my final slide, so sorry I went a little long, um, but I wanted to be sure to explain some of the charts which are a little more complicated than normal. Um, the economic outlook is intertwined with the pandemic. I think the charts that I showed kind of highlighted that um, those parts of the country that opened up quickly did get a, a short-term burst of activity, but are now suffering as they are seeing changes in behavior and changes in state mandates. As a result, the forecast remains quite uncertain. I think the high frequency data that I've been showing you on spending and mobility highlight that if the pandemic gets worse, we're gonna see more of a slowdown in the economy. So the, currently the unemployment rate is at a little bit above 10%. That's quite discouraging if we see a significant pause with the unemployment rate so high and the inflation rate still uh, below 2%. Uh, the pandemic is really, solving the pandemic is really the solution we need to get the economic recovery full. <clears throat> um, the headwinds that are imposed by social distancing make it very difficult for some sectors of the economy to fully come back. Stimulus has been really significant but we can't offset with stimulus some of the public health crisis. So it's really important that the limited or inconsistent efforts to control the virus 
uh, place both citizens at unnecessary risk of severe illness and possible death, but also prolong the economic downturn. So uh, I'll stop there and I'll be glad to take some questions. Eric, thank you very much. It's Carol Bullman from Jack Conway here. And um, I, on behalf of the South Shore Chamber, I wanna thank you for that presentation. Uh, it's been an honor for me to serve on the advisory committee. And one of the things that I've appreciated in getting to know you is you have an, a unique ability to be able to take some very complex concepts and break them down into not only understandable um, concepts, but also concepts we can use. And you mentioned, Eric, that most of the people on this call today represent small and mid-sized businesses. We have a number of banks, nonprofits, and all of the information that you shared today will help us as we navigate through this process. So first of all, I wanna thank you. And I'd like to start out by asking you, you talked about the fact that New England has fared relatively better than other parts of the country and we're able to clearly depict why that is. Do you have a sense for how the South Shore, our region, where most of the, ba the um, banks and companies are represented are, are um, on this call? Oh, you're muted, Eric. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I didn't mute. <laughs> um, uh, we are seeing increased activity. I mean, I think, it, you know, you drive to uh, the malls, you drive to the strip malls, you're seeing more activity, you're seeing more people out, you're seeing more traffic. Uh, you're in real estate, I'm sure you're seeing a, a lot of real estate transactions that are very active in the suburbs. I think you see a slightly different picture when you go into downtown Boston. Um, because many people do not want to commute on mass transit, and many people do not want to take an elevator on a tall building. Um, you're seeing that businesses are starting up in Boston much more slowly. So if you're a restaurant or a business that uh, required a lot of people to be in tall office buildings, I think those businesses have been disproportionately hurt. I think out in the suburbs where uh, you can socially distance more easily, where parking is more available, um, you are seeing some pickup in activity. That is not to say that we're back to where we were. Um, I think that uh, people are still concerned about their personal health and safety. Uh, I know a lot of people are still not comfortable eating at restaurants and being outdoors, uh, even at restaurants. And so uh, that's just gonna take a while until the pandemic has been uh, brought completely under control and that we either have a vaccination or better treatment so people aren't concerned. But I would say I think the suburbs in some sense relative to the city have uh, performed a little bit better. And I think that reflects the fact that it's so much easier to social distance in an uh, area where we don't have a sense of population and where it's easier to get there by car. Thank you. Yeah, I, we've certainly seen that on the real estate um, side of things, sort of a de-urbanization of um, our communities, both residential and businesses. Um, moving over to some of the areas that are more economically stressed, some of our distressed communities in our regions, what, what activities are you at the Boston Fed watching most closely for long-term economic damage, um, in particular for these struggling areas? So unfortunately, areas that we're already not doing as well are doing even less well now, in part because many of those small cities are cities where people are living in uh, much denser uh, settings. As a result, there are frequently more people in a household, there are more people next to each other, it's more difficult to social distance. And many of those people are people that are working in jobs where they're essential workers but not making a lot of money, but they are being exposed to the virus. So I think one of the very unfortunate aspects of the pandemic is it's likely to make income inequality a bigger problem. So we're closely monitoring what's happening in many of uh, the cities. Some of the areas where the pandemic has hardest hit are also some of our poorer uh, parts of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And so we've been very actively monitoring that. Um, I think getting the, the pandemic under control will particularly benefit those areas. But I am concerned that the longer we continue to not get the infection under control, 
uh, the more risk it is that some of this unemployment becomes much more permanent. So one of the concerns is you don't want businesses to actually close. That severs the relationship between the employee and the employer. And looking for a new job in this environment is quite challenging. Many businesses are already looking to reduce their payroll, not to expand their payroll. So that's exactly what Main Street's trying to do, is trying to make sure that businesses that don't have to shut down, don't shut down so that we continue to maintain that relationship between the, the employee and the employer. And I think that's particularly true in low income areas uh, where it is going to continue to be difficult uh, for them to find work. You, know, you, you talked a lot about the Main Street program, which we really appreciate. And um, there was a question from the audience here about small businesses with annual revenues, $150,000. Um, the, the person that asked the question asked, would I still be able to qualify for Main Street lending? So it seems that as PPP has gone out there and be able to assist a number of uh, members of our population, Main Street may be becoming more interesting to people as they learn more about it. Are you finding that, Eric? I think that's right. A lot of small businesses were helped by the PPP program, as you're highlighting. Um, I think there's a question about whether there is going to be any congressional action at all, and if there is action, whether something like a PPP might be part of that package. So uh, it is possible that Congress will take actions to help small businesses once again. I think if they don't, um, we are going to find more of those businesses that had a bridge through the PPP program will look to the Main Street Lending Program. I would highlight that this is really a program that's focused on businesses that are a little bit larger than the smallest businesses. So the minimum loan size currently is 250,000. Um, loans, for th these are really cash flow loans. So they're a little bit different than loans that would be small denominations that frequently are lent against a house, or against a personal guarantee, are really something uh, more akin to looking at credit scores. So this program is really designed uh, for those businesses that um, have a loan size that would be greater than 250,000. But I do think that some of the businesses that have not looked at this program before may find it attractive if, uh, in particular, if Congress doesn't develop some kind of program for small businesses in the next round. Great. And do you think that will ebb and flow and the um, sort of the way your, your criteria for lending will change as the need changes? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, depending on economic conditions, we've made a number of changes to this program. So uh, this is a program that's had extensive outreach. One of the reasons it took so long to set up was there really was very extensive outreach to talk to both uh, businesses and banks to try to make a program that worked for both. Um, so I think that uh, the first term sheet, we made major adjustments. We expanded the program. Uh, we then made adjustments again to try to lower the uh, minimum loan size. Uh, we've expanded it to include nonprofits. So if we're finding that it's not meeting a need that's important to meet, um, it's a Board of Governors decision and a Treasury Secretary decision about expanding the program in different ways. Um, but I think if we find there are a lot of unmet needs, I'm fully confident that the Board of Governors and Treasury would take a fresh look to see if we needed to make adjustments. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for that information on Main Street, Eric. Um, let's move a little bit back um, to the economy again. Do you, um, one of the questions from the audience was, do you contemplate negative interest rates? Do you think it will happen? And what's your view on the impact if this decision does occur? So I think the Federal Reserve has been pretty clear that uh, we think negative interest rates is an unlikely policy tool to be employed. Uh, I've learned over time never to say we're never going to use a tool, but I would find it very, very hard to find a situation where I think negative interest rates actually make sense. Um, when people talk about negative interest rates, um, it, it really is not on, for the most part, depending on the country, uh, does not mean negative interest rates in terms of corporate borrowing. And I think it's much more important to directly get at corporate borrowing. So these facilities are designed to lower the interest rate for small businesses and large businesses. So the New York Fed's running a corporate liquidity facility that was very successful in bringing down uh, corporate bond rates. Um, so I do think that we have other tools that are likely to be more effective that actually get at the cost of financing of households and firms. 
And so uh, I would think that those would be the tools that we'd be primarily focused on rather than negative interest rates. Negative interest rates, I think, do have negative consequences for banks. I think it sends the wrong signal about what you expect for the economic recovery. And frequently in many countries that go to negative interest rates, people save more and spend less. And as I mentioned in my talk, uh, one of the goals is to actually get people to spend more. So if you're a retail store, you don't want people saving all their money. You want people going out to stores or going online and purchasing goods and services. So um, for a variety of reasons, I don't think uh, negative interest rates would be particularly effective in the United States. And I do think that we have other policy tools that are effective. Thank you. As far as um, New England business goes, um, what do you think the best bets are for um, to be able to mis withstand some of the economic shocks that are going on right now? And which sectors are, do you think are most vulnerable and where do you see opportunity? So obviously the most vulnerable, the ones most affected by the pandemic. So my real concern is as we get into the fall, um, as some schools open, as some colleges open, um, it's going to be much harder to control the virus unless we're really good about those behaviors that I highlighted, wearing a mask, being socially distanced. Um, we still don't have nearly enough testing. Um, and so that is a challenging environment to get people to go into the fall and winter. So those businesses that really require uh, social interaction are going to be very challenged. If you were a movie theater, if you uh, have concerts, um, getting large groups together, I think it's going to be challenging going into the fall. If you're a retail that requires foot traffic as opposed to online, I think that's going to be challenging. If you're a hotel um, or a restaurant, uh, some restaurants are doing takeout. Um, some restaurants are trying to have more outdoor seating. Um, that works uh, probably until we get to October. But as it gets colder, it's going to be much harder to do outdoor seating. So I think the sectors that have already been impacted are likely to be more impacted unless we're successful in keeping the pandemic restrained. So I'm very worried that some of those uh, businesses that are most dependent on uh, not being socially distanced could be possibly even more challenged as we get into the fall. I mean, I think the sectors that have benefited have been ones that have been flexible in thinking about creative ways to adapt to uh, the change conditions. Uh, online businesses and businesses that are very focused online are being quite successful. Uh, Wayfair is a very large company uh, located in Boston that uh, does a lot of online activities. Uh, they've been doing a lot more business, so I think that is an example of an organization that's doing quite well. Um, so I think there are some businesses that are being very agile and thinking about how to cater to services. I think uh, providing successful takeout for a restaurant. It's a difficult model, um, but I think that the restaurants that do it well uh, hopefully can bridge uh, to the time when people can once again do indoor seating. But I think continuing to think creatively about how to do things in social distance way. I mean, I would have thought real estate, for example, would slow down more. Uh, I think you're seeing that uh, there are a lot of transactions occurring. Realtors are being quite creative, for example, in doing showings online and doing socially distanced uh, ways of seeing the property. Um, so that activity has actually done better than I would have expected. So I think you are seeing businesses that have uh, been pretty creative and those businesses that adapt are having more success. But I do think that um, if you really require social interaction, this is a challenging fall. So the ability to adapt is so critical at this point. We're at the top of the hour and Eric has agreed to give us five extra minutes if we ran tight. And we've got a couple excellent questions from the audience, Eric. If you could um, provide us a few more minutes, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, this question I think is on all of our minds. Uh, do you have, a, have concern about the amount of debt that the nation has taken on in the last five months? So it's much cheaper to wear masks than it is to have fiscal policy. And so dealing with the pandemic, uh, is the best way to make sure that we don't have to borrow as much money. Yes, I am concerned about the amount of debt that the federal government's taking on, particularly if the pandemic extends for a long period of time. This is the time for fiscal policy to take actions. Businesses have been badly disrupted through no fault of their own. Individuals have been impacted through no fault of their own. 
I think it's appropriate use of fiscal policy, and I actually strongly support taking uh, strong fiscal actions now. But I would say that taking strong fiscal actions and taking very few public health actions is completely the wrong mix. If you want to actually make sure that the debt doesn't explode, you have to make sure that we get the pandemic under control. So if we looked more like Europe, I'd have much less concerns about needing more stimulus at this stage. But we don't look like Europe. Our infection rate is still way too high. Our death rate is still way too high. There's still person-to-person -person transmission. Um, until that stops, uh, we're going to need significant fiscal support. So while it is a concern, this is an appropriate time to take fiscal policy to get us through an emergency. Okay, that, that, that's really in interesting. Thank you for that. Um, another question came in, what do you see as the future of the banking industry, um, in particular the community banks through all of this? Do you believe the community banks come out stronger or weaker? And what does this all mean for the lower income communities or rural communities? So I think in many respects, community banks can provide services that become less uh, easily made by large institutions. Um, the community banks were very active in the PPP program. Uh, there were a lot of concerns initially because I think there was a very quick rollout. But I do think that banks did get substantial fee income from that. Uh, the fact that residential transactions are continuing, a lot of community banks rely on real estate and refinancings. Um, there have been a lot of refinancings because interest rates are at historic lows. Uh, there are a lot of real estate transactions going on as people are rethinking where they want to live. I think those all benefit uh, small community banks. And I would say that the loans that we've seen through our portal on the Main Street facility are disproportionately community banks and those banks under $10 billion, which highlights that they're adapting very quickly. They're finding ways to find loans for uh, community businesses. And I think that businesses are gonna be looking for banks that are very responsive to their needs. And if those are community banks, I think they're gonna benefit. That's not to say that a large bank can't do those activities, but I do think that uh, there may be some benefits to a community bank that meets the community needs in a better way than other organizations. Thank you for that answer. I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call that um, really enjoyed that answer and appreciates it because we, um, we absolutely support our community ba banks and see them as a very important part of our, our community. So one final question, Eric. Um, as business leaders, you have a lot of business leaders, whether it be nonprofit, um, education, banking, small business, mid-sized business on this call. What can we do as members of chambers such as this to influ influence future economic competitiveness? What can, how can we do our part? Well, I think we can do our part by encouraging people to behave appropriately. So. Um, the main reason people aren't going into stores and into restaurants is because they don't feel safe. And the more that we can do to quickly get people to feel safe, I think the more quickly we're gonna see um, those kind of things occur. I think we're seeing transitions. Uh, we're seeing malls rethink about how they're using their space. I think it's important for those kind of transitions to occur quickly. Um, and I would just highlight that I think the adaptability in the midst of the pandemic, I think businesses, continue to need to do a good job of highlighting that they are providing a service to consumers that can be done in a safe way and encourage individuals to take the appropriate action, but to assure uh, customers that the businesses are taken quite seriously, that they too wanna to make sure that the infection rate stays quite, stays quite low. So I think for the next year, we're probably going to be dealing with this pandemic, even if we get uh, start getting vaccines, it's gonna take quite a while for everybody to get it. We're still having a problem getting tests for everybody. Vaccines aren't gonna be immediately available either. So I think we need to plan this as more of a marathon and less of a sprint. I think in March, everybody was hoping this was gonna be a sprint, uh, but this is gonna be a marathon. I would say that uh, you need a plan that's not just gonna last through the summer, but it's gonna last through the fall, the winter, and probably the spring. Great. Thank you. Eric, you've been so open and helpful with all the, um, your, the questions that you've answered and your presentation was really helpful. And I think all of us will leave with this statement, path of the economy will depend significantly on the course of the virus. So we appreciate that. I'll now hand it back over to Renee to close out the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol.
Thank you so much, Eric. This was just such interesting information. And I think the intertwining of the economy with the epidemiologic data was so critical for all of us to see and understand. And I think a takeaway maybe for all of us is spend some of that money we have, the disp disposable income, help everybody out and socially distance and be safe. And I know in the healthcare industry, we're very, very concerned about that. And we, want, we don't want the hospital shutting down again. We don't want the doctor's offices shutting down again. So everybody uh, stay safe, wear your mask, socially distance, and, and we can get through this. So um, thank you so much, Eric. And I just want everyone to know that his um, PowerPoint will be on both the Federal Reserve website and the Chamber website. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Eric, for your time and Carol. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having uh, such a good program. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Have a great day. You too.